The following program is brought to you in vivid matter sound on Matterhorn Matter. Here's a world of imagination, hopes, and dreams. Let's show up the moment. In this timeless land of enchantment, the age of chivalry, the second star of the line, straight out to the magic, it's like a dream. Oh, wonderful dream come true. And make believe are reborn. And fairy tales come true. Matterhorn Matt presents History Land. The year is 1937. Though the Great Depression still ravaged the country, Walt Disney and his cartoonists managed to strike gold with the American people. Mickey Mouse and his many friends had entered the lives of every family and child in America, and the Silly Symphony cartoons had lifted the spirits of those whose pockets had been wrung dry for most of the decade. Now, Walt and his team were once again daring to do the impossible. A feature-length, animated film. During a stressful final year of production on this new project, Walt received loads of mail from his fans with one consistent and unique request. The ability to meet his cast of cartoon characters in person. This innocent request inspired Walt, however. In his own words at the time, he said, You know, it's a shame some people come to Hollywood and find there's nothing to see, even the people who come to the studio. What do they see, a bunch of guys bending over drawings? Wouldn't it be nice if people could come to Hollywood and see something? Walt's little wistful wish, however, had to remain that just for the time being, as work finished up on what would become Disney's next cultural phenomenon, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> 
Snow White's overwhelming success allowed for Walt and Roy Disney to build a groundbreaking animation studio in Burbank, California. Upon the studio's completion, work immediately began on their next feature films, The Fantastical Pinocchio and The Experimental Fantasia. But Walt had his sights set out his new office window. A small and unused plot of land caught his eye and an idea struck him. What if he could build a small park that people could enjoy when visiting the studio? In 1939, with work on multiple projects underway, Walt called two Disney character model artists, Bill and Bob Jones, to his office for a secret meeting. There, he would express his new revelation and enlist the two brothers in bringing it to fruition. After six weeks of research, they returned to Walt with an initial concept. Their idea was to enter a Bavarian village in the style of the streets from Pinocchio. From there, the village would branch out into various different attractions. One of these suggested rides was a request made by Walt himself, a merry-go-round. The other suggested attraction was a dark ride based on Snow White, in which guests would ride a minecart, enter the dwarf's mine, and encounter characters from the film. Walt loved the idea, but due to upcoming deadlines and rigorous demands from his two upcoming films, the project was temporarily delayed. Pinocchio premiered in February of 1940, with Fantasia following later in the year that November. Both were critically praised as revolutionary artistic triumphs, but suffered from a lack of box office sales. Walt tried again with 1941's shorter and less expensive Dumbo which made just enough money back to keep the company from disaster. But still determined to push the form he invented, Walt moved on to another ambitious project for 1942, Bambi. But then, the inevitable occurred. The Second World War's ominous cloud had reached the United States by way of the Pacific, and before Walt could move on to his next project, Uncle Sam had summoned all his men overseas. With all his men gone, Walt had no choice but to cease any further production on major film projects. With all the losses suffered from his previous slate of films and with no future projects on the horizon, Walt and Roy feared the worst for their little studio on a hill. With future prospects looking grim, Walt Disney suffered a nervous breakdown. He needed an escape from the pain that his own studio had brought him. Any idea of a recreational park had been forgotten, but little did Disney know that he was already building up a brand new cast of characters that the American public would fall in love with. Would his Bavarian fantasy village resurface out of public necessity, or would war ring in a new reality for Disney? Nothing would be certain until the fog of war had cleared. From one of the world's most gifted motion picture creators comes Disneyland, whose wondrous portals open to Adventureland, Tomorrowland, Frontierland, and Fantasyland. Fantasyland, where even elephants can fly, and little boys understand the simple language of the animals they love. Tomorrowland, taking you on miraculous trips to outer space, far beyond the orbits mankind has reached today. Adventureland, bringing you exciting stories of man's exploits and of the animals Walt Disney loves so well. Frontierland, where men of the mountains and men of the plains tame America's flaming frontier. Disneyland, it's wonder, fantasy, and adventure. See it every week on ABC.
It is now 1952. After a wartime trip south of the border, artists Mary Blair and Herb Ryman had discovered their unique artistic voices and let their inspiration spread to their fellow collaborators Claude Coates, John Hench, and Ken Anderson back home in Burbank. Now, feature-length animation had reached new heights, and with a healthy mind and newfound inspiration, Walt Disney began thinking seriously again about his little park. In fact, it started to occupy more and more of his mind despite a tight schedule. John Hench noted, I'd often work over the weekends, and one Sunday I looked up and saw Walt out there pacing an area with his long, three-foot strides. I knew he was measuring space for something. He'd walk a certain direction, then walk another way. Well, by the end of 1952, Hench found himself transferred from animation to Walt's newly formed Wet Enterprises, along with Claude Coates and Herb Ryman. Walt's park had grown from a Bavarian fantasy village and carnival to an experience unlike any other. And like most of Walt's ideas, it grew bigger, and bigger, and bigger. From a small recreational center on an unused lot on the Disney Studio, to a whole new expansive world on an orange grove in Anaheim. Perhaps the growing scale of Walt's Park was inevitable. But now in 1953, Roy Disney had to sell his brother's impossible dream to the bankers who would finance his project. Walt Disney had to find a way to visualize the park he saw in his head. It had grown so large since those initial concepts back in 1939 that he had to find a way to articulate his new and grander ideas. In one long, sleepless weekend, Walt eloquently and passionately described every detail of the park to a reluctant Herb Ryman. But, Ryman was inspired by Walt's vision, and in that weekend, with Walt by his side, they created Disneyland. But with so many new lands and experiences, what would happen to the Bavarian fantasy village where the world of Disney animation would come alive? This special land was not forgotten. Now, it would live, as Walt described to Ryman, within the walls and grounds of a great medieval castle whose towers loom 70 feet into the air. Within this medieval courtyard would lie the original inspiration for Walt's park, a Snow White ride and a carousel. There would also be a Peter Pan ride and an Alice in Wonderland walk-through attraction. This new land was to be called Fantasyland. Disneyland began to take shape, and with it, the park's central land. Walt brought in an eager set designer from 20th Century Fox, Bill Martin, to help his talented artists bring these highly detailed worlds off of the canvas and into reality. Martin was appointed art director for Fantasyland, and worked closely with Walt's core team of artists. This included Herb Ryman, who, at Walt's request, continued exploring concepts for the land's beckoning entrance, the castle. Walt wanted a castle not only as the landmark for the whole park, but as a gateway to Fantasyland. A castle is fantasy in any language, said John Hench. Walt agreed, and so, Ryman got to work and looked toward the backdrop for many classic fairy and folk tales, Germany. He was inspired by the Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria and started to draw pencil sketches based on the famous European landmark. Imagineer Harriet Burns then took Ryman's drawings and turned them into small, 8-inch models. Walt also decided to name the castle in honor of their upcoming animated film, Sleeping Beauty. He even brought in the film's art director, Ivan Durrell, on board to help with Fantasyland's design. Burns enlisted both Ryman and Earl to each paint their own version of her small castle models. Ryman painted with lighter colors. Soft pinks with blue turrets filled his castle. A simple and realistic approach for what was to be a portal to fantasy. Earl's approach was more fantastical using gothic blacks, reds, and golds with a multicolor array of orange, pink, red, yellow, and purple turrets lining his 8-inch medieval structure. Walt preferred Ryman's version, expressing that the light blues would complement the Southern California blue skies, 
However, he also expressed concern to Ryman that his version was almost too realistic. Walt left Ryman with the assignment to revise his castle before the final design approval. He had a special project in mind for Fantasyland that preoccupied his mind. It was the hunt for something that he knew he wanted from his park since 1939, a merry-go-round. Enamored with the Griffith Park carousel in Los Angeles, Walt asked owner Ross Davis if he knew how he could find a similar model for Disneyland. Davis's carousel was a rarity, having been built in 1926 and featuring a rare type of merry-go-round horse. There were four types of carousel horses, listeners, stargazers, top-knot ponies, and lastly, the rarest of them all, the one with all four hooves off of the ground and up in midair, jumpers. For Disneyland, Walt wanted only jumpers. And so the search began. Ross Davis eventually tracked down a vintage carousel at Toronto's Sunnyside Park. William Denzel had constructed the model in 1922, and it featured all different types of animals, from cats and horses to deer and giraffes. But Walt didn't want a zoo on his King Arthur carousel. He wanted only horses. He wanted jumpers. Over at WED, Imagineers were well underway, working furiously on the many Fantasyland attractions. Bob Gurr was busy designing the two trains for the Casey Jr. Circus Train. Chris Mueller was hard at work sculpting flying elephants for the then-titled Pink Elephant Ride. A Canal Boats of the World was in the works for a proposed lagoon and Claude Coates and Ken Anderson were stuck in a room mulling over old storyboards, trying to figure out how to adapt major Disney animated films they had worked on in the not-so-distant past to dark rides. The only note Walt gave them was that each attraction was to feature a unique emotional experience, one with drama, one with humor, and one with beauty. It was back to the drawing board for the both of them. Walt hired Ross Davis to refurbish the horses for his carousel, but they ran into a problem. There were not enough jumpers. Davis scoured the country for more, eventually finding some at Coney Island Pier in San Mateo, California. Now, the King Arthur carousel boasted 72 horses, all from different origins, and all jumpers. Unused figures were promised to Ross as a gift for his help, and some were even passed along to help Bob Gurr finish constructing the Casey Jr. Circus Train. Casey Jr. was going to be Fantasyland's thrill ride, and Bob Gurr was tasked with making the bulky circus train go at safe speeds while still maintaining thrill. Over at the dark rides, Ken Anderson and Claude Coates were on the verge of a breakthrough. They realized that in order to fulfill Walt's request, Mood and atmosphere were more important than following a cohesive story. They created new storyboards that hit on key moments in each film and focused on the proposed emotional experiences. Snow White and her adventures would be the ride filled with drama, Mr. Toad's wild ride filled with comedy, and Peter Pan's flight, Beauty. Since mood was key, Coates and Anderson designed each attraction without the main protagonists. The guests themselves would take on this role as they embarked on their adventures. They would be Peter Pan flying through London, Snow White escaping the evil witch, and Mr. Toad learning the consequences of his motor mania. Bill Martin worked on the attraction's track layout first, and then Coates and Anderson would figure out how to fill in the space with their storyboarded ideas. They began mocking up the attractions in the studio before moving to the construction site. Over in another room at WED, Herb Ryman anxiously waited along with managers and other Imagineers for Walt Disney to come approve the Castle Forecourt model. He had not yet been able to make the changes Walt had previously requested, and everybody in the room was warning him about what Walt's response would be. In a spontaneous and impulsive act, Ryman grabbed the top of the castle model, turned it around, and placed it on the model backwards. Everyone in the room was in shock, and prepared themselves and Ryman for Walt's extreme disapproval. Just then, Walt walked in. The room was silent. He took one glance at the model and said, That'll work. The castle was approved and construction on Disneyland began.
Fantasyland kept losing its budget, and Bill Martin had to quickly figure out how to maintain quality on a scaled-down budget. Compromises had to be made. At this point, Chris Mueller was busy sculpting elephants with mechanical flapping ears for the now-titled Dumbo the Flying Elephant. At the same time, Imagineer Blaine Gibson, in one weekend, was busy sculpting a figure of Timothy Q. Mouse to be featured on the ride mechanism. Things were going along smoothly. One of the major centerpieces of Fantasyland was to be a pirate galleon straight out of Peter Pan. It was called the Chicken of the Sea Pirate Ship, and was going to be sponsored by the Van Camp Seafood Company. Aside from working on the Dumbo attraction, Chris Mueller was also tasked with sculpting the mermaid figure which was featured on the ship's bow. He finished his mermaid, but Walt disapproved. Walt then summoned Mark Davis to take over the project. It seemed progress on Fantasyland was starting to take a bumpy turn. Time and money continued to fly away. A majestic medieval courtyard was no longer viable. Bill Martin had to act fast. Drawing inspiration from Ivan Durrell's concept art for Sleeping Beauty, he made the dark ride exteriors themed to a medieval fairground, which would extend to the rest of the castle courtyard. Bob Gurr had to tone down the Casey Jr. ride, Claude Coates ended up having to paint the backgrounds of the dark rides himself, Chris Mueller used Mark Davis's Tinkerbell designs to finish the mermaid sculpture, Harriet Burns had to sit atop the Dumbo ride with a fear of heights to paint the Timothy Mouse figure, and the canal boats of the world would have to go without any scenery, and the guests would ride in loud, diesel-fueled boats. Fantasyland stumbled and collapsed into Disneyland's grand opening on July 17, 1955, with the majority of its attractions not even able to be opened until the end of the summer. Not even the Mickey Mouse Club Theater, next to the Snow White ride. And even while incomplete, guests fell out of the Peter Pan flying boats, Dumbo's flapping ears broke, and cast members persuaded guests to avoid the canal boats. Fantasyland was a nightmare. But one thing was clear, a new art form was born. In 1956, new changes. Ken Anderson and Ivan Durrell filled the Sleeping Beauty Castle with a walkthrough based on the upcoming film, and the canal boats of the world started to receive miniature models designed by Harriet Burns based on Disney's beloved films. It was now called the Storybook Land Canal Boats, and featured a giant model monstro, Cinderella Castle, Pinocchio's Village Among the Alps, and many more. The Skyway to Tomorrowland opened as well and was the first of its kind in the nation. Fantasyland was starting to become its own, and so was the rest of the park. You can ride a rocket to the moon Spend a day with Daniel Boone Pinocchio and Peter Pan and Cinderella too And Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs will say hello to you Fantasyland continued to grow, but not all new ideas were met with enthusiasm. The Imagineers learned more and more the art they were inventing. In 
Claude Coates and Ken Anderson were busy designing a new dark ride based on Alice in Wonderland. In its completion, it was filled with zany gags and gimmicks with little story or cohesive atmosphere. It was never Walt's favorite. Meanwhile, by 1958, Walt grew restless once again. On a trip to Switzerland while shooting the film The Third Man on the Mountain, Walt became inspired by the majestic Matterhorn. He immediately returned from the trip and knew exactly. After Walt died at the end of 1966, he left behind many unfinished projects which would have to move forward without his guidance. The major one of which was planned on a large plot of land in Central Florida, Disney World. With Roy Disney's determination to fulfill his brother's final dream, they would start by first creating Disney World's own version of Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom. Staying true to Walt's wishes, however, the park would feature new and different experiences within the same basic structure as Disneyland. With more knowledge and expertise on the art form they had invented just 15 years prior and with lessons learned from the chaotic Disneyland construction, Walt's artists felt more creatively able than ever to bring their visions to reality. Herb Ryman immediately went to work once again on the park's castle landmark this time to be based on Cinderella. Less than 15 years later, he finally figured out how to execute Walt's note all those years prior. Cinderella's castle would fully embrace the majesty and fantasy of what would be the Magic Kingdom. Hired by Walt before he died, Imagineer Dorothea Redmond would help with the Florida Fantasyland. One of her contributions would be designing the mosaic murals that would line the archway walls through Ryman's castle. A lot of the old team would bring similar experiences to the Magic Kingdom's fantasy land, and with the advent of the human audio animatronic figure and new revelations in designing dark rides like Pirates of the Caribbean and The Haunted Mansion, they could create new and fresh takes on the Disneyland originals. Only three of the four Fantasyland Dark Ride attractions would return to Disney World. Peter Pan would receive a new ride system, 
three-dimensional animatronic figures and new scenes. The same would go for the now titled Snow White's Adventures. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride would receive the most radical changes from its Anaheim sibling. It would now feature two different tracks with two similar but different experiences. Magic Kingdom would also receive a version of Mary Blair's It's a Small World, but this time the queue would be indoors with some subtle new design elements. Fantasyland would also have its very own lagoon and would feature its own version of the Disneyland submarine voyage, themed to 20,000 leagues under the sea. Closer to the castle, Imagineers were designing 96 audio-animatronic figures for the Mickey Mouse Review, a stage show that featured some of Disney's most beloved songs in its film catalog. There would also be, as in Disneyland, a Skyway to Tomorrowland. Walt Disney World opened on October 1st, 1971, and with it, a brand new kind of fantasy land. Disneyland over the next decade saw new growth in many of its lands, and a new generation of artists would see it through. New artists like Tony Baxter, who, mentored by Claude Coates, made the West a little wilder with Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and was currently working on WED's ambitious Epcot Center. Disneyland's then-president Jack Lindquist wanted to go farther with the park's growth. He wanted to do a complete remodeling of Fantasyland, saying, After all, this is show business, and you can't run the same old show forever. Imagineer Raleigh Crump, who was Disneyland's supervising art director, agreed that Fantasyland needed a major refurbishment and assigned Tony Baxter as chief of show designer for the new project. Attractions started closing in 1981, and work commenced. Baxter would note, The hardest thing for me was not the designing of a new fantasy land, but being there the day that they had tore down the original. As he and his team looked at the demolished murals his mentor had hand-painted and all the props and sets scattered and destroyed along the floor, Baxter gasped, Oh my god, what have I done? But demolition continued. Baxter and his team convinced themselves that they were out to improve Walt's fantasy land, not destroy it. This endeavor was not without its bumps, however. In an attempt to move and save both Skull Rock and the Chicken of the Sea pirate ship, the two items broke when moved. Baxter discovered the hard way that these pieces were built fragilely and could no longer use them in his new land. The next biggest change was to improve congestion in the main courtyard. To do this, the King Arthur Carousel would move to where the Mad Tea Party had been, and Dumbo would move to where Skull Rock had been. Mad Tea Party would move to an area closer to the revamped Alice in Wonderland ride. All the attractions were refreshed, with new backgrounds, sets, and animatronics. But the spirit of these rides would remain. Recalling back to Walt's initial inspiration in 1939, Baxter redesigned the facades to be themed to a Bavarian village, just like in Pinocchio. And speaking of Pinocchio, Baxter would leave his mark on the land by designing a brand new dark ride centered around the iconic film. Baxter's new fantasy land opened on May 25, 1983, and was a welcome change to the park, with many longtime guests commenting that they felt like it had always been there. Less than a decade later, Baxter and his team would take the lessons learned from Disneyland's new fantasy land and design a fresh and original land for Disneyland Paris, just as his mentors did for Disney World's Magic Kingdom. The tradition of respecting and re-enlivening the fantasy lands all around the world still persists today, from coast to coast and sea to sea. Fantasyland contains the mystic memory of youth and the promise of a more sensitive and joyous tomorrow. In its central location on Disneyland's map, it proves that without youth and imagination, humanity would cease to move forward. It is the infinite canvas on which imaginations of infinite age can play. As author Ray Bradbury has said, Walt has proven again that the function of Disneyland is to make men over, make them wish to go on living, feed them fresh oxygen, grow them tall, delight their eyes, make them kind. This is Fantasyland, and may it continue to unite and inspire humanity for years to come.